Hello everyone, my name is John Russell and I'm the lead minister of Cornerstone Church in Nottingham. And I'm going to speak to you this Easter Sunday from those verses that Catherine read earlier in Luke chapter 23 and 24. So uh, please do turn in your Bible to them or have them on a, on a screen like, like I do. I'm preaching from an iPad for the first time ever, so we'll see how I get on with the, the technology. And in those verses, we're going to see three things. We're going to see a death. We're going to see a decision and we're going to see a declaration. So firstly, let's look at verses 44 to 49 of chapter 23, where we see a death. Sadly, at the moment, as you well know, the, the news is dominated each and every day with grim, stati grim statistics from the UK and from other countries in the world about how many people have died from coronavirus. And whether that's a high profile person or whether that's a dearly loved family member or friend, every death is tragic and death is an unwelcome intrusion on the good world that God created. Yet here in our passage from the Bible that we're reading today, we read of a death that was extraordinary in anybody's estimation. Jesus had been hung on a criminal's cross by the Roman authorities and that in itself, of course, was, was, no, was no extraordinary sight. Many, many people had been executed in this way over the years. But from what Luke writes for us, we're to understand the significance of what was taking place as Jesus hung dying on that Roman cross. Because we'll see that Jesus was as unique in death as he was in life. There were two signs that tell us this, two signs that accompanied the death of Jesus. Did you see what they were in verses 44 and 45? Let's read those, verse 44, Luke chapter 23. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Two signs, darkness and the temple curtain being torn in two. Let's think about the, the darkness first. What did that darkness signify? Well, in the first place, the darkness signified mourning. A terrible death was occurring. And Jesus himself had said earlier to those who had come to arrest him, this is your hour when darkness reigns. Dark forces were at work in the arrest and the execution of an innocent man. But the darkness signified something more than mourning as well. In the Old Testament, as we read it, darkness can actually signify God acting in judgment. You might remember that we see it as one of the plagues that was sent upon Pharaoh, a plague of darkness. But here, God is acting in judgment against his only son. The punishment of God on God. God's right and just punishment for all human wrongdoing and rebellion and injustice. God's right anger against that, his righteous anger against that, is poured out upon his son at the cross in his death. And the punishment that was upon him has brought us peace. The darkness that, that surrounded him has brought us light. And the death that enveloped him has brought us life. And we're given a striking illustration of this as Luke uh, pans, as it were, pans the camera away from the crucifixion scene and to the heart of the temple in Jerusalem in the second half of verse 45. You know, there were 13, uh, temple, 13 curtains in the temple and the grandest of these was, was really as thick as a, a man's hand. Think of it more like a, a deep carpet than a, than a curtain, but a, car, a, a, a thick curtain that was, that was hung up. And this curtain had a very clear function. It was there as a very tangible barrier. There was no mistaking its purpose. 
Its function was to block all eyes from and to prevent access to the most holy place. The place where God's presence in all his purity and holiness dwelt. And only the high priest, and only the high priest once a year, and only the high priest once a year with blood offered for himself and for the sins of people, this animal, animal's blood offered for himself and for the sins of the people could enter. Well, I wonder how you've been finding the, the social distancing over these last few weeks. Isn't it strange? Isn't it strange to be at a distance from other people? Isn't it strange not to see and not to be able to spend time with our members of our extended family or other friends? Isn't it strange not to be able to spend time with them in person? As I have been thinking about this, I think this social distancing gives us just a tiny glimpse, just a tiny glimpse of the spiritual distance between humanity, sinful humanity, and a holy God. And that's what the temple curtain signified, that spiritual distance. We sing a song at Cornerstone called Living Hope that, that, that says, how great the chasm that lay between us. How great the chasm that lay between us, a sinful human, humanity, and a holy, pure God. And I think we get just a glimpse of all that in the social distancing and the pain of that that we're experiencing at the moment. And yet in one moment, in one moment, the temple curtain was torn in two. We read elsewhere that the, the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom, God reaching down in his grace to human beings. Now imagine being in the temple and seeing that happen, know, knowing all that the, the curtain signified, the barrier between sinful humans and a God of awesome purity torn into blood. Perfect. The perfect blood of Christ had been offered in sacrifice. Blood that would give unlimited eternal access to the Father for every child of God. I wonder, are you looking forward to the day when you'll be able to see your extended family and your friends again? when you'll be able to spend time with them, when you'll be able to embrace them. I know that, that I am. That time when there's, there's no distancing, but there's closeness. Well, friends, how much greater should our joy be that Jesus has given us everlasting access, everlasting closeness to our heavenly Father, to experience his love and his embrace. And if you've been a Christian for a while, then perhaps, like me, you've taken that access to the Father for granted. But well, is today a day when we need to recapture something of that awe and that wonder of what Jesus has done in giving us access, closeness, proximity to the embrace of our Heavenly Father? The temple curtain is torn into. There is no longer spiritual distancing because of Jesus. As we read on in these verses, we read of Jesus speaking his final words. And as he breathed his last, death came to Jesus. If you look in verses 47 and 49, we see the, the reactions of those who, who witnessed this. There was a centurion. And he, even a Gentile centurion, recognised that this was no ordinary death. This was no ordinary man. And those who gathered to witness the sight mourned and went away. And those who knew Jesus, his followers, stood at a distance watching these things. I read an article on the BBC website recently, maybe you saw it as well, and it was entitled The Month That Changed Everything. The Month That Changed Everything. And in this article, it, it tracked through the, the, the month of March, marking the various milestones that we've seen along the way, showing how British life 
rapidly changed in just a matter of few weeks. We still can't quite believe how much has changed, can we? And, and just how rapidly it has altered. Well, if we look back in Luke's account of Jesus's life and death, we, we pick up the story with Jesus's devoted but dejected followers after his death. They had little left now. This was the end. Everything had changed. There was no glimmer of hope. The darkness that encroached into their lives was great as, as Jesus slumped in death on the wooden cross. Any joy that they had was long since extinguished. And they wanted to give him something that at least resembled a, a decent burial. It was the best that they could do now, really, to, to honour his death. And we meet someone in verse 50 called Joseph of Arimathea. He was a man who was a, a leading figure. He was a good man. He'd not consented to the council's decision and their, their action, which then led to Jesus' death. And he, uh, Joseph, was a man who had a deep longing in his heart for the kingdom of God to come. The kingdom that God had, had brought near in Jesus, the kingdom that Jesus had, had preached. The kingdom which actually had been more than glimpsed in Jesus' life and his teaching and in his, in his ministry. But now for Joseph, that kingdom must have seemed further away than ever. Joseph owned a family tomb that had been freshly cut into the rock nearby and he decided to use this, this tomb to give Jesus' body uh, an honourable burial. And we need to notice some of the, the detail that's in this story. It's easy to skip over, but there's some detail here. It's very significant for us. Joseph was a man of courage. You see, up until this point, we read in John's account of Jesus' life, in John's Gospel, up until this point, Joseph of Arimathea had been a follower of Jesus in secret. In secret. But now he, he steps out in courage. He went boldly to ask Pilate for, for Jesus' body. And if we think about it, Joseph had everything to lose and very little to gain. It was a risky decision, but he now steps out courageously. He steps out boldly as a disciple, a follower of the despised and dead Jesus. You see, other people had shown love and started to follow Jesus publicly when he was alive and when he was speaking. But Joseph started to publicly follow Jesus when Jesus was dead and silent. He associated himself with a man who was already dead and therefore seemingly incapable of helping him any further. It might have seemed completely pointless. Joseph certainly wasn't jumping on some populist bandwagon, but he confirmed an attitude that had been germinating in his heart for some time and now grew to become public. And this was required considerable courage from Joseph. His, his discipleship, the fact that he followed Jesus, was now out in the open. And you know, sometimes God puts us in situations in life where we too need this kind of courage. Times when we know that we need to say in public or maybe online that yes, I'm a follower of Jesus as well. Sometimes that kind of thing can happen when someone's actually been a, a Christian in their heart for some time, but, but God thrusts us into a circumstance or gives us a decision to make that means that we know we need the courage to say, things are different now. I'm a follower of Jesus. And we need that courage to, to stand up and be counted as a follower of Jesus. Is now a time for some of you to stand up and be counted and show that same courage as Joseph had. That yes, you can say, I'm a follower of Jesus too. Well, as we move on to hear the declaration 
that's in chapter 4. I don't know about you, but I found the, the flow of information just over these last few weeks to be almost really overwhelming. Checking news updates on my app on the phone, floods of, of messages on different WhatsApp groups, communications that are pouring in from around the world. Trying to think as a, as a leader, as a church leader, what I need to communicate to, uh, to people, what I need to receive and, uh, and how I need to communicate and, and where and to whom. And at times in these last few weeks, it's felt, it's felt almost overwhelming and it's felt that there's been so much noise. Maybe you found that too. And I think we do need to regulate that flow of information that we, that we receive and we need to understand the, the effect that it has upon us and upon our on our lives otherwise our minds and our hearts and our emotions will just be become overwhelmed if we're not careful there's a, a helpful article on the gospel coalition website that we put out in the church news which came out on via email on on thursday and there's also a link to it um, in these in the notes below this video as well do check that out that's that's a really helpful article for how we manage the flow of, of information that we receive and its effects upon us well, as we come into chapter 24, let's think about the, the light of that first Easter morning, in the early morning, as the women walked with heavy hearts towards the place, the tomb of Jesus' burial. And let's, as you cast your eyes down to the, those opening verses of chapter 24, let's, let's linger with them there for a moment. Let's try to get a glimpse of, of how they felt that, that morning. They were likely to have been exhausted in, in mind, in body and spirit. They were deep in mourning, deep in grief. Their hopes had been extinguished. And all they expected was sorrow upon sorrow upon sorrow. When in fact, they were about to be moved from sorrow, firstly to, to fear. As they find that the, the stone has been moved, the body is not there. And they wonder, has someone stolen the body? What's happened? And on top of everything else, they're now confused, they are bewildered. And as if that wasn't enough, suddenly two angels brightly radiating the splendour of God appear. And the women bow, bow with faces to the ground, no doubt. Uh, as, he, uh, as a mark of respect, but also avoiding the light. Well, their hearts must have just been pounding with fear. And then the angels speak, the angels speak words which are both reassurance and rebuke. Verses 5 and 6 of Luke chapter 24. The angels say, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Some political commentators and journalists have noticed the, the power of phrases that contain three words. And so over recent months and years, we've had various examples of, uh, of that, of how politicians have, have utilised that. So we've had take back control. We've had get Brexit done. And more recently, and perhaps most importantly, we've had wash your hands. But there are three words which more than any other words completely transform everything. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Friends, those three word, words have changed our lives and have changed our world forever. Those three words have changed the eternal future of billions of people. And those are three words that can ring through our lives to give us joy and hope and confidence. We think that our country has changed just in a month. 
but the world changed forever on that first Easter Sunday. So let me say, whenever, whatever you read on social media, whatever you hear on the news, whatever you see on the television, particularly at the moment, whatever noise surrounds your life, let those three words speak above the noise and above the confusion, above the bewilderment, above the fear. Let those three words speak above them. Let those three words speak more loudly. Christ is risen. The women around the tomb were the first to receive the news that Jesus was risen, no longer dead, but living. And the angels needed to remind them that this was all part of God's plan. This had all been just as Jesus told them it was going to be. And what an impact this news must have had upon these women. Shock, joy, wonder. They now had uplifted faces and they bore witness to what they'd seen and, and been told to the disciples. But these men seemed not to be impressed. It seemed like nonsense. They didn't believe it. Peter, to his credit, did rush to the tomb. Only in time would all the disciples come to believe that the Lord really was risen. And it was that belief, that truth, that would give them energy and would sustain them for a lifetime of serving the risen Jesus and for a lifetime of sharing the good news about Jesus with other people and doing that very boldly. We've seen, haven't we, how, a, how quickly a, a dangerous virus can spread throughout the world to devastating effect. And in contrast, the good news of Jesus spread rapidly across the Roman world in the years that followed Jesus' resurrection but it brought not devastation, but joy and life and hope. The good news of Jesus changes our world and it changes us too if we're following Jesus. So let me ask, where are you today? As we look at the cross and as we look at the empty tomb, where are you today? Maybe you're just beginning to think about these things and you're you're wondering what it all means maybe you've got questions and and you know that you want to explore more about who Jesus is and why he came to this earth and if that's you then we'd love for you to visit the pages on our church website that are labeled investigate christianity there's a link coming up on the screen now to those pages but others of you will have travelled something of that journey already. And you feel today a bit like Joseph of Arimathea might have felt. Perhaps you have been on, on the edges of church in, in one way or another, and you've been wondering why all these people follow Jesus, all these people that you've, that you've met are following Jesus and, and are living their lives for him. And yet now, perhaps to your great surprise, you're finding something stirring in your own heart. And you're finding that you too want to be a follower of Jesus. You know that you want to take that first step of faith and, and decide to follow Jesus. And if that is you, then I might not know you. But you will know deep in your heart that it's you and that Jesus is calling you to follow him today. And I'd like you to invite you this morning to, to become a follower of Jesus, to become a Christian, to take that first step of faith. And I'd like to invite you to do that by praying a prayer that I'll lead us in. The words will come up on screen shortly. And I'd like you to, to invite you to, to say those words with me, to pray that prayer with me, if you'd like to become a Christian now. So let's pray. Dear God, I know that I, I have failed to live for you and have sinned in thoughts, 
and word and deed. I can do nothing to save myself and look to you alone for mercy. Thank you, Jesus, for taking the punishment on the cross that my sin deserved. I believe you rose again from the dead and are alive. I turn from all I know to be wrong in my life and I want to receive the forgiveness and eternal life that you offer. I ask you to come into my life to be my saviour and my Lord. And by your Holy Spirit, help me to live in a way that honours you and help me grow as a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer, then you join with hundreds of others in Cornerstone, knowing that whatever the future holds, our future is secure because Christ is risen. And over the coming Sundays, as we put more uh, Sunday content out on, on YouTube and on the website, we'll be looking at other parts of the Bible that help us understand the, the, the amazing implications of the fact that Christ is risen for our own lives and how that, how being raised to life transforms us now and for eternity. Our lives are changed forever. If you did pray that prayer, then we'd love to know. Please do get in touch with us via the email address that's on the church website and also the, and the, it's the same email address that's coming up on the screen now, office at cornerstonechurch.org.uk. Get in touch with us. Let us know that you've prayed that prayer and we'd be delighted to send you some resources to, to help you in, in the next steps of following Jesus. Because of Jesus' death, all of those of us who follow him, we can join in with the declaration that Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. So let's join our voices in song as we sing that great Easter hymn. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering sun.